Now, there is um, one problem with uh, phones today is that a lot of people only have cell phones. So people that don't have landlines are automatic, automatically excluded from these types of surveys. So that can be a bit of a bias because younger people tend not to have landlines. Uh, so they may be underrepresented in our sample. You can see the timeline there. As I say, this data has been analyzed and written up and it will be coming out uh, published uh, within the next month or so. So here is a bit of uh, the breakdown of our sample. You can see there we don't have an even uh, gender split and we do have a, a smaller representation of the under 35 uh, group. You can see the breakdown by education, marital status, employment status, and also their geographic uh, location. As I mentioned, all 10 provinces were, were represented, but we probably have an over-representation of, of rural um, residents here in the sample. I believe Canada is about 80-20 in urban. So, as I mentioned, one of our main goals was the purpose of pandemic planning. So we, we, right at the very beginning of our, uh, so this is a survey, but it's being done over the phone. One of the very first questions that we put to uh, the people on the other end, what should be the primary purpose of pandemic flu planning in Canada? And then we would give them these options. They would listen to uh, each of these options being read out, and then they would indicate their choice. So I was thinking that we could have a little bit of audience participation here this evening. What do you think? average Canadians would say in, uh, in response to this. So sort of maybe by show of hands, who thinks that saving as many lives as possible here in Canada would be the uh, most selected option? Anyone think that one? Oh, almost, almost everybody. What about saving as many lives as possible globally? One vote. Maintaining social order? One vote. Protecting human rights? No takers. Preventing economic decline, no takers. So survey says, fully 50% of Canadians said that saving as many lives as possible globally uh, should be our number one goal. Followed closely behind by saving as many lives as possible in Canada. So over 90% said saving lives. Um, which was somewhat of a, a surprise to us. You could see by a show of hands here, that uh, it wasn't exactly what you predicted either. So once we sort of got that sort of generic question out of the way, we turned to these four uh, ethical issues. So the first one is duty to care. We gave them sort of a little scenario just to sort of set the stage. So during an influenza pandemic, healthcare workers will face difficult choices. During SARS, fears arose about becoming infected and then potentially infecting others. Healthcare workers were torn between these fears and a sense of duty to their own patients and solidarity with fellow workers. So that was just to sort of give them an idea of what this issue is about. Our primary research question related to this theme is, to what extent do healthcare workers have a duty to care? So we asked uh, the, our respondents, we gave them this question and asked whether they agree or not. Healthcare workers should report to work and face all risks provided safety precautions are provided. Fully 90% agreed with that, which is a very high number. Healthcare workers who do not come to work without a legitimate cause should face loss of employment of professional license. So now you can see that there isn't as much agreement here. It's closer to a, an even split with just less than half uh, agreeing and 38% disagreeing with that. So you can see that there, there certainly isn't a unanimous uh, opinion on this issue. Healthcare workers should not be expected to work if they themselves have a serious health condition, close to 90% agreeing with that, or they should not be expected to work if they must care for young children or elderly parents. Over half agreed with that. So we're getting some, in some cases, some clear signals, in other cases, a little bit of a mix. Governments should provide disability insurance and health benefits at no charge for healthcare workers at risk during a flu crisis. Again, a very high percentage here, 85% agree with that. I'm not sure that that was factored into the budget that came down today, though, that uh, government should be uh, expected to provide those insurance and benefits. Government should reserve the right to conscript. Now, conscription is always a very uh, thorny issue. 
So what do we think here? What do you think? What percentage of our respondents do you think uh, would agree with this statement that uh, government should reserve the right to conscript healthcare workers during a pandemic? Does anyone have a guess? This is based on a sample of 500 average Canadians. 5%. Any other guesses? 50? Yeah. Very close. Almost half agreed with that, but then almost half disagreed too. So again, it's a, one of those issues that really almost splits right down the middle. So you can see that we're not getting, in this case, a clear signal on how we should proceed. What about the role of employers? So we talked about the role of healthcare workers, the role of governments. What about the role of, say, for example, hospitals? So if a worker does not feel safe, they should be able to file a grievance. 84% agreed with that. That's perhaps not, not uh, surprising. So that's uh, one issue. Turning to our second one, which is priority uh, setting, also sometimes re referred to as resource allocation. Again, this could sometimes be a very uh, thorny topic. So governments and health organizations have stockpiled antivirals and other resources in anticipation of the pandemic. Even so, in the event of a pandemic, the healthcare system will be likely be overwhelmed with patients. So that was just sort of to set the stage. Our primary interest here is who should have priority access to scarce resources in a pandemic? So we thought about how are we going to get people to tell us who they think should have priority. So first we address the issue of antivirals. So you'll recall that back when the pandemic uh, was first uh, being discussed, there was a lot of talk about TAMI flu and stockpiling TAMI flu. So what we did was we had the people on the phone and we read out this list of different groups to them. You can see there ranges from children through seniors, uh, healthcare workers, public officials, we read this list out to them and asked them for each one, should this group have priority access or not? So out of those groups, who do you think emerged as um, among those that had the, rated as these groups should have the highest priority? Healthcare workers? Children. Children. Any other guesses? Those two, healthcare workers and children? You nailed it. Those were the top two. So 43% of our respondents said yes, children should be uh, given priority access, and 40% said that healthcare workers uh, should have priority access. What about the lowest? Public <laughs> officials. Public officials. <laughs> Single adults. Single adults. Any other guesses? Seniors. Sorry? Seniors. Seniors. So here you see those, so seniors, yes, uh, 50, only 15% said that uh, seniors should have priority. Uh, public officials there, 18, only 18%. I have to say that, uh, you know, as a scientist, I always try to remain neutral and objective, but as a single guy, this finding for me <laughs> is perhaps uh, the most disappointing. Right at the very bottom, single adults, only 14% of our respondents said that single adults should have priority access to antivirals. We, I included adults with chronic illness there because that struck me as uh, somewhat low. I, we, we expected that that would be perhaps a little bit higher. So that's antivirals, like Tamiflu. Now we turn to hospital services. So this is, for example, getting admitted uh, into intensive care or getting a ventilator. So it's the same question. Who on this list, the list is slightly different, but who on this list should have priority access the hospital services. Any guesses? Which of these groups do you think came out at the top with the highest priority ratings? Children. Children? Mm -hmm. Patients likely to recover. Okay. Sickest patients. Sickest patients. Let's have a look. So healthcare workers infected serving their patients came out uh, very high. And here the elderly or chronically ill make an appearance, 37%, and children, someone, someone guessed children, 35%. What about the lowest? Single adults. Single adults, yeah. I fear that that'll stay on the list. And your public officials are on there as well. The sickest patients, though, 13%. 
Yeah.